Good morning, Ocean Rangers. I hope you're doing very well today. My name is Jen, and welcome to another wonderful Ocean Ranger Adventure Day. Uh, joining me today in the studio is James, who's showing us these lovely images by Colored Parrotfish, one of my personal favorites. Uh, this is actually one of our newer webcams that we have here at the aquarium, and it's really cool. Shows off some of our corals, which we will be discussing later off today. Uh, but we also have Carrie that is taking all of your questions and bringing them into the studio today. So talking about questions, if you are interested in participating today, I would love that. And we would all love it here at the studio. Feel free to text your questions on in to the number below, 562-286-1838. Now, texting rates do apply. So if you are a younger viewer, a younger ocean ranger, please make sure that you get adult permission first as texting and data rates do apply. Now, if you happen to be watching this later and you're like, you know what? I want to be such an extreme ocean ranger that I'm just watching all of these in one day. Uh, you can always go on ahead and email us down below at live at lbaop.org and we'll be happy to answer your questions there too. Uh, but right now, definitely would love any text that you might have. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, any observations, would absolutely love it. Because today our topic is, are you ready for it? Drum roll, please. Adaptations. Yep, today we're talking about all of those different kinds of features that help one organism or help the organism to survive. So uh, thinking about those adaptations, well, let's say you learned a little bit about sharks and teeth, Ocean Ranger. So can you think about how those teeth are adapted to help our shark to survive? What it maybe prefers to eat? Hmm. If you can, go on ahead, whisper it to maybe your sibling. <laughs> Maybe if you're an only child like me, you can whisper it to your fake friends. That's imaginary, but still really cool. Or maybe you have a pet worm because your parents won't let you have a cat or a dog growing up as a kid. You know, you can let your pet worm know. Right? And so if you came up with an answer, yeah, right? Maybe certain teeth on sharks do help them to survive. And if you want to know more about that, rewind to yesterday's ocean adventure class. But if you think about maybe a special adaptation that we have that helps us to survive, well, one example that I can think of right off of our bat are our lungs, right? Our lungs help us to breathe air, right? Air, we're breathing it in, we're getting everything that we can out of it, and then we exhale out. Um, if we think about these fish though, right? They don't necessarily have those, those lungs. What do they have instead that helps them to survive? Hmm. See, our fish here has given us some inspiration. Uh, it has gills, right? Oh, it's going to eat me! <laughs> that was a close one, Ocean Rangers. Did you see that? Oh, I know! I barely made it alive out here. Those are the risks that I'm willing to take for all of you. But with these fish, right, they have gills. So if you take a sneak peek underneath those little gills right there, you will see lots of little um, gill filaments. They basically look like little teeny tiny, almost like hairs. And there's a whole bunch of them in there. And that's what the fish has, those gills, to be able to help it to breathe. Ah, here's a great picture uh, of a basking shark right here. And you can kind of see its gills um, right here, called gill rakers. So this is, it has less of those frilly parts and more of these almost like cagey parts right here. And that's what helps it be able to kind of like eat the stuff that's through the waters. Because the gills are partly for breathing. <sighs> But I don't have gills, silly me. Partly for breathing, but it's also partly for eating too, especially for some of our filter feeding animals that are able to use that part. So kind of crazy, but kind of cool. And that's actually probably kind of the theme for our class today. We're gonna be looking at relationships. The crazy, the cool, the sad, the happy, all of the above. All right, friends. Now I'm gonna go on ahead over to our document camera and we're gonna be looking at some different general relationships. Now these relationships are found in the ocean, but it's also found on land too. Beautiful. So all the relationships that we're gonna be talking about have different kinds of names. Now the overarching umbrella term, right? The, the big name 
is called symbiosis. So it's how animals, right, live together. So bio meaning life, sim together. So it's how they are living together, right? So they are having their relationships. And there's basically three different kinds that we're gonna be focusing on today. One, the first one, where everyone's happy and having a great time and both benefiting is going to be called mutualism. So denoted here by one happy animal and our other happy animal, right? So these are going to be mutualism. Right, so or they mutually benefit. Mutual meaning that they both benefit. All right. Um, so this is if we want to put it together, mutualism or mutualistic symbiosis. Now, there's another kind that's called commensalism. Right, it's a longer word, commensalism. But it's where one animal's happy and the other animal's like, yeah, that's all right, I guess. Right. So one animal's like, this is great. I can benefit. Life is great. And then the other animal's like, that's cool, doesn't hurt me, I'm just here, right? And then we have the last one, parasitism right here. So when one person's like, yeah, this is the best, I'm loving life, and then the other person, right, the other animal's like, mm, I'm not a big fan of this, it's actually hurting me, I don't like it at all, right? So these are mutualistic symbiosis, commensalistic, symbiosis and parasit uh, parasitic symbiosis, right? But we're gonna be calling them mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. And we're gonna go through a wild ride of going through all of these different kinds. We're gonna be looking at different examples here in our ocean, all right? Now, we're gonna be starting out with the, with the warm and fuzzies. We're gonna be starting out with the mutualistic relationship, so mutualism. Can you think of two animals that really might benefit from living together, from hanging out together, in the ocean that is. Hmm, or even on land, if you can think of one relationship on land too, where two animals might benefit, that works. I'll give you a minute just to kind of think about it. If you wanna text in too, what relationships you're thinking of, like, oh yeah, I could totally think of blah and blah. Feel free to go on ahead and text them right on in here to 562-286-1838. And it looks like as you're kind of thinking about which two animals benefit by living with each other, right? The two smiley faces right here. We do have a question of, do all fish have different adaptations? That's a great question. And they do. Um, you know, there are so many different adaptations on fish. Their color, their color pattern, um, their, you know, the way that they swim. Those are all in the fins that they use. Those are just a few of the different adaptations that fish have as a whole. And so here, I'm gonna step off to the side. But you can already see many of these are actually rockfish. So they're all the same general variety, but look at that. All of a sudden right here, all different colors, right? So here is a color difference and we can, it's kind of hard to see, these are flag rockfish and they actually have bars that go down them. So that's one way in which they choose to be able to kind of change up their coloration. Others, um, I'm not 100% sure on that one because it's hard to see, that might be a kelp bass right there. Um, that one is a little bit more uh, kind of matching the seaweed color, right? And so there's lots of different kinds of fish and they all have different adaptations. Now, if you're really interested in learning about different fish adaptations, one class I would really recommend is called Fishy Fun. And Fishy Fun focuses, haha, say that three times fast. Fishy Fun focuses on uh, all sorts of different kinds of fish adaptations and it's only about fish. So if you're interested in that, feel free to check it out. We definitely have a lot of different Fishy Funs on our YouTube channel to search for. All right, so have you thought of the two animals that maybe might benefit from hanging out with each other? Hmm, well, I can definitely think of one and I see James has given us a little bit of a clue from our tropical reef habitat. It is one of the uh, more popular relationships that people are familiar with. Now you may have even seen a movie about it, um, but if we're thinking about, well, a clownfish and a anemone. You got it, right? So here is a classic example of that mutualism, right? Where they both benefit. But how is it that they benefit, right? Let's go on ahead and let's delve a little bit deeper. Now we have these clownfish here and we have these anemones. And I'm gonna step out of screen so you can see a little bit better. 
But even though it's just a picture, what do you notice? Hmm. Well, if you're thinking maybe these clownfish look like they're kind of cuddling up to this anemone, you are right, right? So once again, we're looking at two, like both of the parties, we have the clownfish and we have the anemone, and they're both benefiting it. But how exactly is that the case? Now our clownfish, right, they're fish, they move, they have all their fins to be able to move around and dart around. Um, but our anemone right here, do you think our anemone can move? Now I know we're only seeing the very top of the anemone, so let me show you an example of at least an anemone that's off of our coast. Now, our anemone doesn't have clownfish that live with it, though we have other animals called painted greenlings that like to hang around it. But here is our anemone, and basically it has one big foot that it sticks and it glues on, and then all of those clownfish can live up top on our anemone. And there's another great view of an anemone right there, and you can see a little bit of that foot. This one happens to be red in color. Now, looking at just the basics of an anemone to understand what exactly this animal is, because if you look like this, well, I wouldn't think you're an animal at all, right? To me, it would look like a flower, like, ah. Not that you could smell underneath the water. Well, I couldn't, but other animals could, right? But for this animal right here, well, it has one foot that it glues itself on. How do you think it might live. How did you think it catches food? Ah, you may have said stinging tentacles. Absolutely, right? So we have all of these little tentacles right here, and they're billowing in the, in the water right now from the current that's being moved. This is an example of a tide pool. Hey, there's that painted greenling uh, within, our, within our aquarium here. But we have anemones right here, and you can see all of those different tentacles moving around. Oh, we did get an observation. Fish live on the anemone to be safe. Absolutely, right? So like these tentacles that we're looking at right now, right? You can go on ahead and see how these tentacles wave about. They're not just stuck there, right? They do move. They move all around. Maybe they move a little bit here. Maybe they move a little bit there, right? But they're constantly billowing in the, in the current that we have right here, right? So it definitely kind of helps that its singing range is not just right here, but it definitely moves outwards a little bit. So it definitely protects the fish from being stung from, uh, um, by, or it definitely protects the fish by having all of those stinging tentacles. But the singing tentacles also help our anemone to be able to eat. Ah, but here's a great view of an anemone fish right in between all of those tentacles. And once again, if you wanted to add any observations, feel free to go on ahead and text us down here. We really appreciate that you're noticing that these anemone fish are lying right inside of these tentacles right here. Now, something uh, that's really neat about the relationship between the fish and the tentacles is that the fish actually has a mucus coating around the outside of it. Now that mucus coating does a lot of different things. That mucus coating helps to act like a band-aid. So if that fish ever accidentally got a scrape, ow, then that mucus coating would cover it and it would, you know, keep it safe from any kind of bacteria. Uh, that mucus coating also helps our fish to swim a little bit faster, which is kind of cool. And that mucus coating actually um, matches up a little bit with the different types of bacteria and mucus that are found on this anemone. And that's what makes their relationship really special right here, is that this fish rubs up all against that anemone, like you saw earlier, right? And they share some of those same bacteria communities that live on the anemone and also on the fish right here. So they know that they are paired up together, all right? Um, and so we did get a question of why are anemones different colors? Ah, that's a good question. Some of it is due to another special relationship where there is an algae that can live inside the anemone, turning those little tentacles green, believe it or not. Um, so we can delve a little bit deeper into that later on, but that is another special relationship that the anemone can have with algae inside, is that the algae provides the sunlight. And then uh, and just if you think about, well, plants on land, right? When they get that sun, what do they do with it? 
they do something called photosynthesis, right? Where they get that sunlight, they use it to get energy. And that energy is in the form of tasty, delicious sugar, right? And so some of that sugar is then given to the anemone as energy. So the, the algae will take some, and then the anemone will take some. But you know what? Who else gets food? Well, this clownfish goes on ahead and it eats food and any kind of crumbs that it might leave, because even though it lives in, in the anemone, it'll go out a little bit and it might eat a tasty shrimp or maybe it eats, um, you know, a smaller kind of worm and it'll come and it'll eat it, yum, 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 over the anemone, right? Because if it just ate it out in the open, guess what? Other animals might want to steal its food or chase it away. So it brings that food back towards the anemone, yum, 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 eats that food up. But of course, these animals are always the cleanest eaters, right? They're messy. They leave crumbs. So all of the crumbs get sucked up by our anemone friend right here. So all of those tentacles can grab any kind of those crumbs and bring it in to the middle of the sea anemone, which is where their mouth is. Yep. So that little belly button hole that you saw earlier is actually the mouth of the, the anemone right there. Pretty crazy to be able to see. Right. And then Shinja is asking, do all anemones have different color feet? Oh, that's a great question. Right. Now, the, even though um, some of the colors of the anemones within the tentacles may come from an algae that lives inside, um, their, their feet parts, they can just be different colors, just like how we might have different color hair, um, you know, and different color eyes. Same thing for the anemones. There's just different kinds and different varieties out in the ocean, too. And they live in all sorts of different habitats, too. So hopefully that answered your question, Shinja. All right. So we've had a chance now to look at a, uh, two beneficial animals, right? A mutualistic uh, symbiosis. One in which we have two very happy animals. We have our anemone that is getting a chance to eat any kind of crumbs that are left behind from our clownfish. And our clownfish gets protection from other animals from all living in all of the singing cells of our anemone too. Now a bonus for our clownfish is that it can also lay its eggs on the anemone too. And that's an extra layer of protection. No predator is going to want to go in there to be able to steal those anemone fish eggs, right? Because they would get stung every time. It'd be like, ow, 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 right? Really tricky. Look at them. Aren't they cute? Look at their little face and those tentacles. Oh, such a wonderfully mutualistic relationship between these two. Now, Kansha and Shinja are asking, do anemones sting? They sure do. They don't sting our clownfish friend, but they definitely will sting one just so that way the anemone can eat because the anemone can sting um, other fish or other smaller animals to be able to eat. Uh, but they can, that's their main way of defending themselves, the anemones that is, to be able to sting. So absolutely they can. All right. So once again, we had a chance to look at two animals that benefit from one another, right? Um, they both get treats, they both get tasty foods, and they both get protection from one another. Protection, even if this, someone tries to peck at our anemone, well, guess what? This anemone fish, this clownfish, will go on ahead and be like, no, this is my home and my partner, meh. And it'll go on ahead and it will peck at the other animal, right? Uh, and nip at them. And so it's definitely a really wonderful relationship here. Now, all relationships aren't as wonderful. Uh, sometimes, you know, one animal does tend to benefit while the other one's like, eh, whatever, right? Do you remember what that kind of relationship is called? Hmm. If you were thinking commensalism, you are correct, right? So we covered mutualism, two happy animals. Now we're going to look into one that benefits and the other one's like, meh, that's life. And so can you think of any kind of animals that might, might have that kind of relationship? Hmm. If you can, feel free to text it on in. I know for me, one that I can think of is of a, ah, there we go, right there. You, I can think of a gray whale. Yep, a gray whale. So I went from kind of small to really big, right? So with our gray whale, do you think whales go super duper fast? Not so much, right? These gray whales are fairly slow movers. And so with these gray whales, they have, well, a partner that lives on them. Yep, here we go. See all these lovely crusties right here? 
these are all barnacles. Yep. And some of them might be whale lice too. Though I think blue whales probably have more of that lice on them. Um, but these are gray whales right here. Gray, because they're kind of colored gray. And they have all of these little barnacles. Now, all of these barnacles that we have on this whale, well, it's a little hard to see from here, but these barnacles are filter feeders. They eat the plankton that's out of the water. They look crusty because, well, they are crusty. They have hard shells on them. And these hard shells um, basically are their home. And when they want to eat and they want to eat the plankton, they put their little feathery feet out and they go on ahead and they move it around and they bring whatever food that they want back into that shell. Now, when you're a filter feeder, sure, you can just stay in one spot and filter feed. But you know what makes feeding even more exciting and even more tasty and delicious and get even more food? If you're on something that moves. Yeah. So this whale right here moves fairly slowly, so slowly that it's allowing these animals, as they start out as plankton, to settle down on them. Yep. So they don't go super fast. And so once these animals settle on this hard whale right here, it's able to put out its little feet. And as the whale moves, those feet don't have to do as much work and they can catch more and more food because all of that water is rushing by them. So it's a really cool way that these barnacles, these little crusty friends right here, are able to, to collect and eat even more food. Clearly those barnacles are pretty happy because there are definitely a lot on them. Now, with those gray whales, it's not only sometimes on their head, uh, on top of their head, maybe sometimes it's a little bit on their sides. And what's really interesting about gray whales in particular is that these whales, uh, oh, here we have an awesome video. I'm gonna step off the screen for a little bit. And we're seeing a few of those crusties, right, on top. But as you can see, maybe some of that brown stuff, right? Now that brown stuff isn't what you think it is. Or maybe it is. Mud, yep, mud. And so with this mud that they have right here, these gray whales love to eat, not the mud, but the animals that live inside of that mud. They do that by something called grubbing, where they take a bite of the mud. So if we imagine this is our sea floor, and I am the gray whale, they will take a bite out of that mud. Now, depending upon the gray whale, they might be right-handed feeders or left-sided feeders. So maybe they eat this way, or maybe they eat this way, right? And depending upon the side that they choose to eat off of, either left or right, those barnacles will be scraped away on that one side. So if you get a, ever get a chance to see these gray whales and maybe get a real good look into what side you're seeing or this face, right, you may be able to figure out which side it likes to take its breakfast, lunch, dinner, maybe snack, right, second breakfast, any kind of meal that it chooses on that particular side. So in this case, right, the whale is not very affected by it, right? We saw it moving just fine, fancy free through the water, enjoying its day, the sun, the water, the mud, right? Happy, happy as a whale. Um, and, but these animals right here, right, they don't necessarily benefit the whale, but they sure get something out of it, right? All of these barnacles, they get extra, extra water to filter through so they can eat even more plankton. So in this case of commensalism, right, our barnacles definitely get tasty food, while our whale is absolutely unaffected. All right, we did get a few questions that came in. Are anemone stings deadly? Ah, not to me, right? Not to us, we as humans uh, may feel more sticky than stingy, but for other animals, maybe like a super small fish, um, or maybe a worm, or maybe some plankton, it absolutely is deadly for them. And how do they know it's a clownfish so they don't sting it? Ah, well, clownfish have, um, once they've kind of started their relationship with it, they have bacteria that they share because they wiggle on in with each other. And so their, um, their, their slime and the coating that's on them is actually, they share some of the, the same, the same, well, properties basically. And so that's what kind of helps connect them with each other. Yeah, good question. Awesome. All right. I think we might have time um, for another relationship. Uh, let's look, go on ahead. Let's look into one more commensalistic relationship, actually, because there are a bunch out there. And maybe you've thought of some and are right now texting them in because you're like, oh, Jen, guess what? I know of another commensalistic relationship. Now, if you're thinking of a shark, perhaps, and maybe a suckerfish known as a remora, 
hey, green lines think alike, right? So here we have our whale shark right here, right? Kind of like the gray whale, really kind of large, right? Same thing for this whale shark right here. Also very, very large, right? These whale sharks can go up to like 60 feet or thereabouts. So bigger than a school bus. And so these animals also much more slower moving. So what do you think this fish might be doing stuck to this whale? Hmm. Well, let's look at that placement of the fish. Looks like it's very close to the mouth, right? And believe it or not, this fish actually literally has like a sucker that attaches itself to that whale. Hmm. Now those barnacles ate plankton and that's what they were able to kind of sift through the water of that gray whale. What about this remora fish right here? What do you think it might eat? Well, if you're thinking extra little bits, either from the whale shark or maybe any kind of other animals that may drift on by, you got it, right? So now these remoras aren't, I mean, they are found on whale sharks, but they're also found on a variety of other sharks too. And what's great is they're able to eat any of the crumbs, once again, right, that help uh, that these sharks will eat. And then they will benefit by all of those tasty crumbs, right? So maybe if it's like, the, you know, the shark ate a fish, yum, 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 yum. Then that remora can get all of those little tasty fish crumbs. Like, oh, that must have been a really good part of its fish's stomach. Mmm, that was a really good fish cheek, right? All of those little extra crumbs that it comes down, this remora can definitely benefit from. And once again, it doesn't move super fast, so the remora can stick on nice and easy. And not only does it get tasty fish crumbs to eat off of, but it also gets protection, right? I mean, it's on a shark. How cool is that, right? I mean, if I wanted a best friend, a shark would definitely be up there, right? So these two, even though I don't know if the shark feels like it's a best friend, but right, this remora gets a lot of great benefits of protection and food from our shark and our fish, our shark friend is like, meh, whatever, it doesn't matter, right? So once again, another example of a commensalistic relationship where we have one animal that benefits, the remora in this case, and the other animal, the whale shark, that's like, yeah, I guess it's fine that you hang out here, doesn't matter to me. All right, now we've talked so far about different kinds of symbiosis, right? Our mutualistic symbiosis with our um, clownfish or our anemone fish and our anemone, We've had a chance to look at two different types of commensalism, right? Our gray whale and the barnacle, and then also our, um, our shark and our remora friend, right? One benefits, the other one not so much. But there are also some parasitic relationships too, right? Where one animal is super happy and the other one is not so much. Hmm. Now, for me in the water, it's kind of tricky to think about. I mean, maybe I can think of like fresh water, like leeches, ooh, right? Or if I'm like hiking, ticks, ooh, right? But if we think about in the water, one of my favorite types of parasitism, I know, kind of weird to think about it, but it's on my favorite kind of fish of all time. Now, my favorite fish of all time is the ocean sunfish, AKA Mola Mola. And you can see why, isn't she beautiful? I know, who couldn't love a face like that, right? But what's really cool about these animals is they are the largest bony fish in the world. Yes, so they can be up to like three meters or like nine feet from tip to tip, right? So you can see it doesn't look like your average fish. And as a matter of fact, this fish isn't doing the average thing, right? You're like, what's with this fish? Why is it at the surface of the water, Jen? Why does it look like it has a weird looking mouth? Why is it on its side? That's not normal fish behavior. Well, good observation, ocean rangers, because it isn't normal animal behavior at all. Now these fish, as you look and see, do you think it's built for speed? It's basically a dinner plate that's flipped on its side. No, right? And so this animal is not very fast. As a matter of fact, it is very slow. It has one fin on top, one fin on bottom. Its tail fin just looks like a nub, right? And it just basically moves back and forth. And that's pretty much what it does, right? It just slowly goes. And as it slowly moves, well, 
parasites go on it, right? It's like, ah, yeah, looks like a really easy ride. Ah, I can just be a copepod and bury my head inside and lay my eggs on top. Ha 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 ha. Perfect plan, right? Now, this poor fish, right? Uh, it's just so big and so beautiful. And it's like, well, copepod, you can be on here for now, but it has a secret weapon up its sleeve. Yep, even though that's a parasitic relationship between that biggest fish in the world and a very teeny tiny little copepod, which is kind of like a shrimpy, crustacean-y kind of friend, right? Um, you could think of it almost kind of like a tick where it buries its head on in. Well, hey, hey, here we have a double relationship. Yep, exactly. We have a parasite relationship, right, between the copepod and the poor sunfish, where the sunfish loses, the copepod wins, but... The sunfish has a special relationship with, are you ready for this? Birds, mm -hmm. particularly albatross. Yep, big, beautiful birds with, you know, huge wingspans, over six feet wingspans. And these albatross are ocean-fearing birds. They live most of their lives out in the ocean, right where these animals, these ocean sunfish live. And they notice that the sunfish is on its side. As a matter of fact, they also notice that this ocean sunfish here is kind of tilting its little top fin back and forth, a little bit out of the water. The albatross then realizes, ha ha, this dish friend right here has some parasites on it. So it flies down on top of this large fish and it starts pecking out all of those copepod parasites. If you listen closely, you might be able to hear the screams. Ah, oh no! Right? And so all of these copepods are no longer on that albatross. That albatross now walks away with a delicious snack in its belly, right? And our, um, our sunfish can go off and live its life happy and healthy. Look at that smile. It's, it's just such a great fish, right? And so this is kind of a twist, right? We had our parasitic relationship with our copepod and our sunfish here. But then we happen to have a mutualistic relationship with our sunfish and our albatross, right? They both benefited. The sunfish was able to get those parasites off, and that albatross was able to get a tasty little snack. Ah, isn't life sweet? All right, ocean rangers. Well, unfortunately, our time is just about up. Now, don't worry. There is a lot more excitement for tomorrow because we're going to be focusing on invertebrates. So animals without any sort of backbone. They're squishy. They're weird. They're absolutely wonderful. In the meantime, if you like bingo like I do, you are in luck because today we are focusing on nature bingo. So this is going to be pretty awesome. Feel free to check it out on our website um, and you'll be able to get a link to the activity to maybe see if you find a treat. Maybe you can find an animal that has two legs and see if you can get bingo. If you do, congratulations! You win. All right, friends, thanks again for a great day, Ocean Rangers, and we will see you back tomorrow. See ya, everyone.